Welcome everyone to the second session of the Generative AI Innovation Incubator. I'm Carolyn Rosé, Interim Department Head of the Language Technologies Institute, and I'm very excited to bring you today a keynote talk by Roni Rosenfeld and an Ask Me Anything panel by fellows of the AAAS Leshner Leadership Institute for Public Engagement with Science. I'm really excited that we'll get to hear Roni's talk today. <clears throat> I've always admired Roni as uh, one of my older and wiser colleagues. When people ask me still, uh, even in my 50s, who do I want to be like when I grow up? Roni is one of those people who I think of. Um, he's all about impact of his work, impact on the world, positive impact on everyone around him. And I think everyone who knows Roni thinks of him as someone who has that effect. He's the chair of the Carnegie Mellon University's machine learning department, professor of machine learning, language technologies, computer science, and computational biology. He's taught machine learning to thousands of students in his career. He's the co-founder and leader of the Delphi Research Group, and he leads a national center for epidemic forecasting uh, by the US CDC. So that is uh, the first event for today, and then we'll have the Ask Me Anything panel. So uh, it's important to us that this whole summer of events is a conversation um, among multiple different uh, segments of society. We want to get different views talking to each other, um, because that's the way that we're going to be able to move forward as the world changes. Um, and so I'd like you to take note of this bit.ly a Gen AI Reflect uh, URL if you want to submit reflections on today's session, and also to indicate that you would like to join our Slack to continue the discussion between sessions. That would be just great. I believe Nicole is going to be putting that um, URL into the chat for your convenience. So keep your eye on the schedule of events. We're continuing to add additional events to our schedules. And in particular, we're about to kick off our, our uh, hackathon series of events and tutorials. So you'll want to make sure that you keep your eye on those dates and opportunities. And now I'll turn it over to Roni. Thank you, Carolyn. It was one of these wonderful introductions that uh, was hard for me to recognize myself in, but I, I appreciate all the comments. Let me try to um, share my screen. So I uh, figured out um, a couple of days ago that I could both share my screen and put my uh, myself on it. Um, and I would like I'm not crazy about giving talks to Zoom. I much prefer give talks to people. So my um, request to you all is uh, if you're not um, in the middle of making a sandwich or taking your dog on a walk, if you don't mind turning on your camera, I would love to see who I'm talking to. Um, I try very much to keep it not a keep to keep it not a, a disembodied over voice, but a conversation. So I'm going to stop. Uh, occasionally and ask for comments, questions, um, whatever you'd like. So um, my talk is about both the past and the future of AI. Uh, the past is gonna be fairly short, just one slide of my personal perspective. Uh, and the future is going to be um, a very shameless um, you know, speculations. Let me start with, um, with the past. This is admittedly a very subjective uh, history of AI. Uh, it's very incomplete. It's very partial. Uh, you would find a lot missing here, a lot you might disagree with, but this is a, sort of my view of take home messages from uh, a nutshell take home messages from 80 years of work on, on AI. Um, one line per decade, no, no more. Uh, so that's awful compression, but uh, bear with me. 1940s, uh, computers are thought of mostly as fast calculators. And starting in 1949 with a seminal paper by Alan Turing, uh, this idea that computers are not just calculators of mathematical uh, you know, um, problems, but they're also universal simulators. You can use them to simulate any kind of computational process, any kind of uh, flow chart or decision uh, process. And of course, that leads to uh, thinking, well, can you use them to uh, study the brain. 
uh, Herb Simon, a professor uh, at Carnegie Mellon University uh, in the 50s, professor in the business school, was very interested in human decision-making and how humans go about the process, what happens in their brain when they make decisions, and saw that as a huge opportunity for modeling how humans do it, simulating how humans do it. And of course, you can also use that to, um, to try to recreate how people do things. And that's how the field of artificial intelligence was created. 1956, the Dartmouth Conference uh, brought together a very small number of people who basically coined that term. Uh, interesting in that group, in addition to an IBM researcher, there were four academics, one of whom went on to run the AI uh, effort at MIT, that's Marvin Minsky, one of them went off to Stanford eventually, that's John McCarthy, and two of them, Herb Simon and, um, and Alan Newell, went on to uh, start the artificial intelligence work at Carnegie Mellon University. Talk about founder's effect. Um, these four people, 1956, are probably responsible for the fact that these three institutions are some of the leading institutions in AI today. So how are they going to do uh, AI? Um, the idea was fairly simple, and I call it understanding-based AI. Uh, that's my term. It's not a term in the literature. It basically says that if you want computers to do things that people do, the first step is to understand how people do it. And then the second step is to simulate how people do it. So if you want computers to recognize speech, study how people recognize speech, understand how the ear works, how the audio uh, neural pathway works, all the way to the audio cortex. Um, maybe bring on board some phoneticians and acousticians and linguists and grammarians and, uh, and uh, lexicographers. Uh, and everybody who has anything to do with language and with speech, bring in experts, uh, ask them to study how humans do it, and then try to recreate that in the computer. And the same thing for other uh, AI-like activities like machine translation and, and uh, question answering and understanding images and planning and so forth. That didn't work so well in the 60s. Uh, the, the view in the 60s was very simple. Uh, people thought that some people thought that translate, translating from one language to another amounted to not much more than having a dictionary of both languages and then taking each word and mapping it into the equivalent word in the other language. And of course, that doesn't work very well. There are lots of funny examples of how that uh, misfires. Um, so in the 60s, there was this opt optimistic view that, um, yeah, we know how people do things and we just have to code it and it will work. Well, it didn't work. And the 70s was more of the same. Uh, the realization that maybe the way people do things is a little more complicated than we think. So let's just study that and try harder. And the 70s were full of um, trying harder, more sophisticated models of how people do things. Um, by the way, when I say 70s, it really went on in the mid 80s. Uh, it's been kind of shifted by, by five years, but there's no nice name for the period from 1965 to 1985. So I called it 60s and 70s. Sometimes in the mid 80s, a new approach came about, which I would call example-based AI. Um, example-based AI says, don't try to understand how people do things. Try to get computers to learn these things just from examples. Some of you may guess that another name from example-based AI is machine learning. To give you a sense of this transition, I came to Carnegie Mellon uh, Computer Science Department as an entering PhD student in 1986. At the time, there were, um, I would say, 60% of the faculty in the computer science department, which was quite large, 60% um, of them were working in AI, uh, different aspects of AI. Um, only, I would say, one and a quarter of them uh, were uh, committed to this uh, new way of doing AI, example-based AI. And if you're curious who this one and a quarter was, the one was Tom Mitchell, whom you heard from a week ago, and the quarter was Jaime Carbonell, who was doing both machine learning, but mostly the old style AI at the time. So in the mid 80s, there was a transition to work more and more on example based AI. Um, and um, if you look at textbooks for machine learning from that time, you will see that there were a variety of techniques that were, were tried, decision trees and, and neural networks and uh, uh, analogy and, and a few other things. Uh, one of the things that were noticed at the time, maybe as a, a relatively small part of the field, was that neural networks are neat in the sense that they are universal approximators. Unlike decision trees and linear regression, 
they can, um, they can approximate any kind of function from examples. Now, it's not easy. It's not, it's not clear how to train them to do that. They need a lot of computation. They need a lot of data. They get stuck in local minima. But generally, they have the, the um, ability, the expressive power, uh, or the representation power to represent any kind of mapping, any kind of function that you would care about. And that was kind of noted on the side that most people moved on, uh, just a few, a few um, crazy prophets like Jeff Hinton continued to bang at them uh, over the 90s. Um, in the 90s, uh, people in machine learning rediscovered statistics. Um, it, it may sound funny to the young researchers today, but most people who were working in machine learning uh, in, in, and in AI in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, many of them did not know that much statistics, and no, not much beyond um, what's taught in, in undergraduate and some graduate courses. Um, and many of the techniques were not statistical in nature. They were heuristic, they were computational, they were cool, but they were not based in solid statistical um, uh, foundation. And one of the things that I'm very proud of at Carnegie Mellon is kind of realizing uh, maybe slightly earlier than most places that really uh, the new form of AI, the example-based AI, AKA machine learning um, is a, some form of statistics. It has a lot of uh, underpinning, the fundamentals are, are statistical. And uh, that required us to figure out where the statistic department is on campus, uh, which we didn't know until that I personally didn't know. Um, and to start talking to the folks there. Um, and uh, that was uh, a process we engaged in throughout the 90s and re resulted or culminated in the machine learning department uh, at Carnegie Mellon being um, um, consisting of equal numbers of people from statistics and from um, co computer science, and then a few from other departments as well. And that process was going in parallel throughout the country uh, and the world. Um, and the 90s was a period of consolidation of the theory of machine learning and putting it on solid statistical basis. In parallel, the statisticians became far more sophisticated in terms of their computational thinking. So the same thing can be said about statisticians in the 70s and 80s. They wouldn't know quadratic or, or exponential growth if it hit them in the face. They were not aware of, uh, uh, most of them were not aware of computational principles and computational ideas. Um, the fields were quite far apart. Um, and the 90s, so pretty much the merge of the two fields. Fast forwarding to the 2000s, um, they're hard to describe because lots of things happen, but um, my sort of highest level description is that we finally figured out uh, how to use many layered neural networks. The neural networks of the 1980s were pretty much restricted to a single hidden layer. Uh, and people noted in passing that you can probably do a lot more with multiple layers, but it wasn't practical because the rate of learning was um, diminishing, was, was shrinking as you had more and more layers. It was shrinking to a halt because we didn't have enough computation, because we didn't have enough data, because we didn't know how to structure the, the learning to, uh, to form um, useful internal representations so that you can do the learning in, in, in phases. All of this was figured out in the 2000s in the field that came to be called deep learning. Um, and there are many, many ideas that uh, contributed to that. I'll mention just a few of them here. Um, the idea of um, forcing the input to pass through a bottleneck and be reproduced on the other side, what's called autoencoding, uh, led to very good internal representations of the input. So you can think about it as if you force to, to compress something in a way that you may need to decompress later, it forces you to hold on to the essential, the salient features of what you're looking at and to get rid of the noise or the not important stuff. And that idea, even though it was known in the 80s and there were some nice papers by Hinton and others that show that you can create interesting internal representations by this bottleneck principle, that was really pushed to, to the limit in the 2000s. Um, and uh, another idea that, that jumped on top of that is if you're trying to learn multiple different things at the same time, that also helps you come up with good internal representations. Because when you learn one thing, you can kind of cheat a little bit, or the system can cheat by learning idiosyncrasies of that task. But if you're trying to learn many, many tasks, the only way to be able to do them is to develop an understanding of the thing that the tasks are based on. So if you're trying to learn both machine translation and speech recognition and question answering and summary and other 
you really, the only way to do it well is to develop a way of representing the underlying language and the meaning of the language. Um, and the tricks for doing that uh, were developed in the 2000s. And a few other tricks, one I should mention is the idea of red teaming, blue teaming. Uh, if you uh, create two different programs, one of them in charge of doing the best classification job you can, and the other one in charge of uh, finding the most difficult examples to fool the first system, and then you pit those two systems against each other, well, you have a perfect recipe for continual improvement. And that's known by the name of uh, generative uh, ad adversarial networks. Uh, the adversary here is the blue team and red teaming. Um, lots of other interesting ideas. I don't want to spend time on them, uh, but I, 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 I'm sticking with, with one that is going to come back to us later. So the one that I pick that I think is the, the most intriguing is the realization that words in natural language can live comfortably in a Cartesian space. So what do I mean by that? I used to teach a lot of sort of natural language related um, courses and statistical modeling courses. And one of the things I used to say to my students is language is difficult because it doesn't live in a nice space. Uh, it's hard to visualize language and to visualize relationships in language. We all know them, we all understand them in common sense and our built in linguistic ability to process information. But we know that large and big are somewhat similar, but they're not quite the same. And we know that they are the opposite of small and tiny. But beyond that, we can't, we don't have a way of taking all of the meaning of all of the words in the language and putting it in, in something that we can compute distances over. Well, it turns out you can. I have to confess, I tried to do it in the 90s. Uh, I wasn't ambitious enough. Uh, I use only two and three dimensions because that's what I could visualize, didn't get very far. But some smarter folks figured it out uh, that you can, uh, using um, statistical properties of, of, of words, namely their, their, their distributional properties, which are the words that tend to occur with, you can automatically create a mapping from every word in your corpus, every word in your dictionary, into a point in a Cartesian space, a space of coordinates. Um, by the way, that space has to be quite large. Um, depending on the task you're using it for, something like 300 dimensions is, is pretty darn good. Uh, to me, that was a huge invention, uh, something that set the stage for what will happen uh, in the next decade. What happened in the next decade in 2010, and again, I'm cheating a little bit, the decades obviously are not starting at, and ending at the end of a decade, but this is the rough period. In the 2010s, um, several developments. One is the ability to process sequences rather than static inputs. So up until that point, most of machine learning was about mapping static inputs to static outputs. Um, language is better thought of sometimes as a sequence. A, a sentence or even a paragraph or a whole book uh, is a sequence that conveys meaning in a way that evolves over time. The ability to handle sequences uh, was invented, and with it, the ability to represent not just the meaning of a single word, but the meaning of a sentence or a paragraph or a whole document in a Cartesian space. Um, and beyond that, the ability to represent the meaning of images in a Cartesian space. And it's the same Cartesian space. That was the biggest um, sort of breakthrough, I think, of the 2010s, the fact that if you represent the meaning of sentences or any kind of text and the meaning of images and perhaps audio uh, and perhaps other modalities uh, like programming languages, and you represent them all in the same space, then you have something that's pretty darn close to a real meaning as we perceive it as a meaning, uh, something that uh, is shared by all of them. So it strips away their, their modalities and focuses on the essence of what they convey. Uh, to me, that's a real sort of philosophical breakthrough um, that we can we can say there is a mapping uh, of meaning uh, into Cartesian spaces. And what's so special about Cartesian spaces? Well, what's good about Cartesian spaces is that we know a lot of, about how to do statistics in, in Cartesian spaces. We know how to, how to approximate distributions in these spaces. So I can, um, I can represent a meaning and then, for example, um, Converted back to language in many different ways. 
which explains why we have such good sort of language generation. And you can hit the button GPT that says regenerate and get more or less the same meaning, but represented in many, many different ways. It's all an outcome of that internal representation of meaning. Now, I'm, I'm going coming to the end, and the end, of course, is not the end. We're in the middle of it, but I'm focusing on a short period from 2018 to today, uh, and maybe I should say which month this year in 2023, because things are moving so fast. But um, what happened in 2018 was a paper came out that um, showed two things. One is that uh, many of the tricks that were developed for neural networks are not needed. Uh, one trick specifically called attention, which is basically a way of uh, um, looking at a sequence or at a multi-part thing and saying which parts are uh, representing which parts are relevant to particular things, and then maybe having multiple of these in parallel, uh, that that's enough to do uh, everything that was done before by a variety of other techniques like convolutional neural, uh, neural networks and recursive neural networks and, and, uh, and uh, a variety of uh, other small mechanisms. Uh, but the second thing that came out of that is that if you train one good representation of meaning using that very simple mechanism called transformers, um, you can use to do use it to do very impressive things. What that paper showed is that with one representation, you can now do every not every but every specialized task that was tried better than an architecture that was designed for that representation. This is quite remarkable and doesn't happen often in machine learning. Usually, if you specialize what you're building to a particular task, uh, chances are you'll do better than a generic jack of all trades. But here you have a jack of all trades that beats everything in their own game. That was quite remarkable. The second thing that was remarkable about it is that when you give it a, um, a chat interface, it blows our minds, right? Those of you who um, experimented with it, which I, I hope is all of you by now, um, must have had this experience, this eerie experience of, oh my gosh, I didn't know that was possible. I didn't know that uh, we could build these things that, that look so human. Now, are they really very much like humans? Is a different question that I would love to discuss with you. But the fact that we are able to build a unified representation that allows us to do all these impressive things, including human-like conversations, um, is I think the biggest um, invention so far. And we're just in the middle of it happening. Uh, this is the end of my historical presentation. I will just add a comment at the end that one other thing we learn on the side is that our, our intuitions are very bad when you move to scales of data that we were not evolved to deal with and to the number of dimensions that we didn't, did not grow up in. Um, so we have pretty decent intuitions for modest amounts of data and for two or three dimensions. But our intuitions go out the window when you move beyond that. And that uh, will feed into my next discussion, which is our ability to predict. But let me stop here and ask for comments, corrections, strong disagreements. Um, you should be aware that if you speak, uh, you're giving your permission to be recorded, for your voice to be recorded. If you'd rather not speak, uh, you can post um, in the chat. Are you able to see the chat, Rodney? Um, yes, so there are a couple yes, of yes, questions can, popping in. Yes, I can see it. It's, it's not a question, it's a comment, but an interesting one. Um, I would say it's not necessarily a Cartesian space. I would love to discuss at some point why, but I would just add that um, um, at least on the surface, um, it's a, in the implementation, it's a, it, it is a Cartesian space. Um, but you're right that the, the actual implementations that are, uh, um, that are created may very well be better represented uh, in other kinds of spaces. Question, is this a form of illusion not really human? Uh, well, you get different answers from different people. Um, I think there's an element of illusion there, uh, but um, let me tell you what I think is illusion, what is not. Um, the representation is not an illusion. The way in which uh, input is represented in uh, this 
space um, is no illusion. It's true representation. It's coherent representation. It's very similar uh, in its properties to the representations that we use as evidenced by the ability of the system to do human-like tasks. The, um, the generation is stochastic, and the people who think that it's an illusion like to refer to it as stochastic parrots, uh, basically free association uh, based on, on the text found on the web. I would say it is free associations, but these free associations are done in language that is coherent to us, using a meaning representation that is coherent to us, and by acquiring input in a form that is natural to us, of us to produce. So uh, you can think of it as a person who uh, understands language, can generate language, uh, can deal with internal representations like people, but how they map the input to the output is somewhat of a free association. But that is likely to change. You know, right now they are very wrong on many things. Um, I assume there's a lot of work going on on trying to reduce hallucinations. Uh, right now, there is uh, very exciting work on reinforcement learning uh, from humans. Um, it succeeded in making it appear much safer than, than it was uh, six months ago. Um, it will probably succeed in imparting many other properties to it. Did AI give up on, on, AI give up on understanding? What a wonderful question. Um, if you go from the 70s to the 80s, if you look at the, at the slide, um, that is pretty much what happened. So you can think about it from a scientific perspective. It was declaring defeat and moving on, right? We were saying in the 70s, the people who were doing it in the, in the, up to the mid 80s were saying, we can't get it to work based on our understanding. Uh, let's get it to work without understanding. I'm, I'm, I'm simplifying a bit here. Uh, it is true that one of the downsides of the example-based approach of the machine learning is that we don't understand it very well. Now, uh, I anticipate a lot of work on trying to understand in those internal representations that are built. In some sense, it's like the old quest to understand representations in the human brain. The difference is we don't have, we have much better access. Uh, we can reproduce these results. We can measure every, literally every bit of it. Uh, so we stand a better chance, I think, of understanding representations in, um, in these artificial constructs, and then maybe uh, consider whether they will uh, also be the same kind of um, understanding in, in the brain. So the AI folks aren't trying anymore, but the COXI folks uh, are trying to um, to understand. Uh, possibly, yeah, and, and neuroscientists, of course, are trying to understand. Can I share my resources? Um, I wasn't uh, producing this from any particular resource, but I can certainly try. I don't know if there are any books. On, uh, there must be books on the history of AI. I'll, I'll look into it and, uh, and try to post something. And again, if you ask any of our faculty to give a 80-year history of AI, it may look very, very different. So keep in mind, this is my impressionistic painting. Let me move um, to the second part of my presentation, uh, and that is about what's next. So when we think about what, what's next, the first thing we need to acknowledge is that we as humanity have a dismal track record of forecasting technological development. And by dismal, I mean, uh, it could be dismally optimistic and dismally pessimistic. There are plenty of examples where we thought something is just around the corner and it never came to be, or it came to be 50 years later. Think of microwave ovens. Um, Think of, um, of um, autonomous driving. There are many cases where we thought that it's gonna be a long time and then it happened uh, very quickly. So just if you are honest and look at our track record, it sucks. It's pretty bad. We're equally bad at forecasting the societal implications of technology. Uh, again, if you go back and read uh, the history of what people said when different, uh, different inventions came about, uh, you will not find much correlation with reality. And, and again, you, there will be cases of missing completely negative implications. Think about the, the atom bomb and the, and the Einstein letter to, uh, to the president during the war. None, none of the arms race was predicted um, and in and, and, and good direction as well. Even worse than our blindness is our blindness to our blindness. This is a point made by Nassim Taleb in his book, uh, The um, Black Swan, 
uh, not only are we very bad at knowing what's going to happen in the future, but we are unaware of how bad we are because as soon as things happen, we look back, reinterpret them, understand them, and say in complete honesty, oh yeah, that makes sense. We kind of thought that's what would happen. I mean, we completely forget how, how clueless and how wrong we were before, and there's plenty of evidence of that. Therefore, we should conclude that forecasts are worthless. So now I'm going to give you mine. First, start with societal implications. Um, these are very unusual times in technology. Um, what's happening is very invigorating and terrifying at the same time in different proportions to different people. Um, at times like these, it's important to remember that there have always been times like these. Uh, so we should look at history and look at what happened with technological developments. And for the most part, I would say they have been good for society. Um, you know, we are we are better off than people who lived 100 years ago, thanks to technology, both in terms of there are many more of us than 100 years ago, but also on average, uh, people are better off today than they were 100 years ago. No question about it. And, and they were better off 100 years ago than they were 100 years before that, maybe to a lesser extent. But there are some caveats. First of all, we're better off on average. Uh, or I'd say for the most part, we're better off on average. But I'm not talking about average over technology developments. I'm talking about average over society. Namely, not everybody in society is better off when new technology comes around. And that is uh, a significant part of our challenge. Um, I like to quote a saying from a uh, mentor and friend of mine, Kentaro Toyama, who spent uh, a lot of time trying to develop technology for uh, underdeveloped countries. Um, and ended up writing a book about his experience and perspective. Uh, he likes to say that technology is an amplifier of human intent and capability, which means when you have good human capability and good human intent, technology can amplify that, can make progress faster. But when you don't have capability, throwing technology at it is not going to make it better. And if you have capability, but you don't have good intent, either because it's in the wrong hands or because the incentives are not aligned properly, um, you're not gonna get good effect of technology, you might get bad effects of technology. By default, my view is that technology amplifies not just human intent capability, it also amplifies inequity, inequality. Um, it by default amplifies uh, social inequality uh, because people who are better off are in much better position to take advantage of technology. Um, and in the current case, it might also amplify corporate inequality in the sense of winner take all and a small number of players having a very large uh, impact or a, a joint part of, of the market. Uh, so these are sort of the natural tendency of technology, which is what I think we should fight. I don't think we should fight technology. I think we should fight the natural tendency of technology to magnify inequality. Now, talking about the likely impact of technology, I want to break it into the technology that's already here, which I've mentioned earlier and which Tom talked about. And later I'm going to talk about some speculation about technology might be coming and maybe not too far future. But here I'm talking just about technology we already know exists, but because it was created just in recent years, it may take it time, some time for it to percolate through the economy and through further innovation into impact in different fields. First, the good, there is plenty of good. I think um, much of it was mentioned in Tom's talk. I'll mention the, the, the sort of obvious, obvious candidates. Uh, education is one, healthcare is another. There are many, many others. I'll mention just the one that's uh, near and dear to my heart and that's public health. Um, in public health, maybe the biggest uh, failure story of the last 50 years is that we know very well what people need to do to lead healthier lives. Uh, and we can even make them know it at some level. But having them change their behavior is very, very hard. The whole field of behavior change and behavior change communication has pretty much failed. Uh, there have been various movements within it over the decades of how to go about doing that. Uh, initially, of course, the, the naive view was you just need to give people information and then that didn't work. So you need to shock them. 
and you need to appeal to their emotions and so forth. The bottom line is it's very hard for people to stop smoking. It's very hard for people to change their eating habits, to exercise. Um, all the things that we know are going to be very beneficial to them. We are, I don't know, we could say a, a lazy species. Uh, or, I mean, maybe that's not a, a, the best way to summarize it, but we are hard to change. However, we have one magic tool. We are social. We like other people, and we especially like that other people like us. So think of techniques that do work. Um, if you are in AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, you get a buddy who helps keep track of um, you know, your progress and keeps you straight. If you are in Weight Watchers, uh, you go, or at least used to go into meetings where people get weighed in public. Uh, you can see the relationship here. If you are um, trying to build an exercise program, if you can afford it, a personal trainer is the best thing you can do. Maybe not because they know exactly what, how, how you should train, a little bit of that, but largely because they provide a human presence that you are accountable to. Think of coaches. Um, think of coaches that ride in the, in the boat ahead of you while you're swimming. Um, in all of these cases, the presence of a human is a huge motivating force for people to do things that otherwise they may not find the discipline to do. So now thinking of um, the generative AI and the chat GPT technology, one of the striking um, salient features of it is how uh, human-like it is. Um, so when we anthropomorphize it, when we start treating it as a human, you might say, oh, that's not a good thing. That's, um, that can lead to lots of problems. And it can, we'll, we'll look at risk later. But it could also be a very powerful thing because you can now have your own private um, uh, cheerleader and your own private uh, um, uh, coach and your own private um, AA body uh, and so forth. Uh, of course, in that case, you need to build the technology to be as anthropomorphizable as possible, as human-like as possible, whereas in other cases, you need to do the opposite. So, so much for... Um, good impact. There's a lot more to say. And of course, there are many things that are going to be developed that we're not thinking about now, going back to uh, my previous comment about um, our, our poor forecasting record. But let's talk about bad stuff. So we're still talking about the impact of already existing technology. And this is the bad in my order of losing sleep. Your order of losing sleep might be different. Um, my biggest concern is deep fake. Um, we already are familiar with the ability to generate fake uh, artificial faces that look real, images that look real, uh, videos that look real are around the corner. They're, they're done and they're soon gonna be indistinguishable to the human eye from, from uh, real videos taken. Uh, voices that sound real, you can take the voice of a public person or of anybody else and uh, use it to say anything and put it in their fake video image. And now you have a video of someone saying something they didn't say. Um, I'm concerned that as this technology gets better and better, uh, our sense of trust and uh, authenticity um, may collapse. Uh, we will not know what to trust. Uh, we are already uh, have a societal crisis of different people trusting different sources, but imagine you turning on your favorite trust source, let's say Fox News, um, and seeing um, a, a Putin, you know, uh, declaring nuclear war, or seeing some some uh, videos showing the effect of nuclear war in some part in some part of the world. Uh, or let's say you turn on uh, MSNBC or, or, or CNN, and it turns out you didn't turn on Fox News or CNN. You turn on something that somebody infiltrated and put in those fake images. Um, how do you know what to trust? I don't know the answer to that. I think one possible remedy is through rethinking our communication channels, uh, creating technology for cryptographic authentication, which accompanies the data all the way from the source so that everybody can authenticate who they are. Um, and then through the network transport so that they cannot be mucked around doing the transport. 
all the way to the front end tools where individuals um, throughout society uh, can have tools that verify for them in a way that will satisfy them that what they're seeing is the real person with the real image taken in a particular place at a particular time. If you look at the browser now, the only um, hint of authentication is in the URL at the top. Uh, most of you, I suppose, know that you should go to that URL and look at the domain name and check that it really is um, cnn.com and not cn underscore n.com. Uh, but many, many people, um, uh, many users in society, most of society are not aware of that. And I think this authentication part has to become a big part, a much bigger part of front end tools. Um, sort of a, a shout out to our HCII friends. Um, the second thing that scared the heck out of me is uh, autonomous weapons uh, and the um, the possibility or the likelihood of an arms race in that regard, not just general AI, but autonomous weapons. Now, all countries uh, declared that autonomous weapons are a bad thing and pledge that they're not going to do it. They also declared that biological warfare is a bad thing and pledge they're not going to do it, but it was a thinly veiled secret that they all did it in the backyard. And the reason they did it is because it could be hidden. In that regard, an arms race, an AI arms race, is worse than the nuclear arms race. With the nuclear arms race, there were two factors that made it uh, manageable to an extent. Not a great thing, but that we survived it for, for 70, 80 years. One is that there was a fairly high barrier to entry. If you wanted to build a nuclear weapon, you pretty much needed to be a state. You needed to have territory, you needed to procure large amounts of material, large amounts of engineering know-how, scientists run lots of experiments. Um, it wasn't something you can do in a hole somewhere. Um, and um, that reduces the number of potential players. The second thing is um, that when you build, when you try to develop nuclear weapons, it is detectable. There are a variety of techniques for detecting the fact that you have uh, fissure material uh, and, and that you're running those experiments and that you're en enriching them and so forth. The fact that it's detectable is a very crucial and important thing. It means that you can sign agreements to uh, restrict the development of weapons, uh, like the SALT agreements and, and other and nuclear disarmament agreements. We don't have that in AI. You can build AI systems uh, using very relatively much fewer resources. Um, and we don't have a way of detecting the fact that you're doing that. Um, so I view the arms race as a very, very dangerous uh, problem. And, and, and people who work in political science, I don't know that they have a solution because solutions cannot rely only on the, on the goodwill of people. They must rely on, on uh, mechanisms that enforce them. Down the line is, is the usual fraud and disinformation, uh, maybe to be tempered somewhat by solutions to the deep fake problem. Um, so I, I, I guess I tend to view fraud and disinformation as uh, a low, low threshold versions of deep fake. You don't need to be very deep. You just need to put things out there and people like them. Uh, the whole um, loop of um, that tends, that was designed to Optimize engagement uh, turned out to be very bad for society, creating fragmentation. Um, so this is a, a process that's already been going on for at least a decade and seems to be set to, um, to get worse. Uh, further down my list is job disruption. There certainly will be lots of it. Uh, there will be winners, there will be losers. Um, I'm not sure there will be a net job loss. Economists argue over, uh, over this issue, um, but um, even if there are no net job losses, there will certainly be losers. And how we handle the losers was going to be a big, uh, important part of how we evolve as society and how successful the whole thing would be. Uh, we did not handle the losers of globalization very well. Uh, and you know what it got us. Uh, and then another concern is too much power in the hands of a few companies. This may not turn out to be a big issue. It's still an open question of whether indeed the power would be in the hands of the companies or or, or this new technology would be democratized. Um, I don't have much to say about that, except that it's it's on my list. Um, let's speculate a little bit. 
longer term development of AGI. So AGI stands for uh, artificial general intelligence. That's the idea of one system that uh, is capable of doing everything or most things that people do, sometimes better than people do, uh, and that uh, appears human-like, much like ChatGPT begins to appear, at least to some people. Uh, so one could say that ChatGPT is the first manifestation of something that's that's truly an AGI. Uh, you could argue, but indeed that is that is the first sparks, as the as the paper title said. Um, this is the time to remind you that technological progress is unpredictable, uh, and breakthroughs surprise us when they happen, and we don't understand them. We don't understand how they work, at least initially. That we have seen many, many times in machine learning in smaller ways. You know, when boosting came around in the 90s, it worked better than other methods. We didn't know why it took five to 10 years to figure it out. When deep networks came around 10, 15 years ago, um, completely surprised us. And uh, people were trying very hard to figure out. And there's some progress in figuring it out, but I can't say that it's fully understood. Um, and on and on, we, the technology comes not because of breakthrough in understanding. What happens in reality is there's a breakthrough in technology and then the understanding first to catch up with it later. Now, there used to be philosophical questions about AI. What happens when true artificial intelligence comes around? And they were very naughty questions that we didn't know how to answer. Um, and uh, we, we had fun debating them. Uh, with philosophers and others, and then we went about our business because that's going to be for our kids to solve or our grandkids because it's not going to happen anytime soon. Well, chat GPT in my mind is a wake-up call. I'm not saying that AGI, that chat GPT is true AGI, but what I'm saying is that we are so surprised by capabilities that we didn't think uh, would come in our day that we should take that as a message that we don't know when these problems are going to raise their ugly head and we'll have to deal with them. So what are these problems? Um, I'll mention two. One is a well-known problem it goes by the name AI alignment. And it's basically the question of how do you make sure that an AI program is aligned with, or namely works to benefit human values. I'm not only concerned here, or the field is not only concerned here about bad actors, people who take AI and, and tell it to do bad things, but also, and maybe even more so, about unintended consequences of good intentions. So the classic, uh, literally classic period story uh, of, of, of unintended consequences is the Midas touch. Midas asked uh, the gods to give him the ability such that anything he touches turns into gold. Um, except he forgot to say, not food and not my daughter. Okay, two very tragic consequences. Um, the, the even more famous example of unintended consequences that, that circulates in the literature is imagine that you have a super, super smart artificial intelligence and you say, I need paper clips. Paper clips. Can you please make as many paper clips as possible? Taken literally, the AI may figure out that the best way to, to, to make as many paper clips as possible is to um, burn down the entire earth and turn it into raw material so that it can maximize the production of paper clips. And of course, you forgot to say, but don't kill any people in the process. Okay, so these are kind of crude examples, but the reality is that we're not very good at conveying what we really mean and what constraints we wish the system to operate by. Not to mention that if we wanted to be aligned to our values, we need to agree on our values. We don't agree on values. We agree on some of them, but we don't agree, agree on many of them. Even when we do agree on values, we're not very good at articulating our goals and our values and our constraints in a foolproof way. I looked around, couldn't find better way, better attempt to convey our values uh, to an AI than Asimov's stories from 50, 60 years ago, which I grew up on. Uh, so Asimov wrote lots of books about robots, and in all of them, there's a common thread of the three laws of robotics. And I thought they were beautiful. They're just fantastic. And uh, the first rule is never harm a person. The second rule is always obey people, except if it conflicts with the first rule. And the third rule is never harm yourself unless it conflicts with the other two rules. If we can build this into AI, that would in, go a long way towards solving our AI alignment problem. 
problem is that we don't know how to operationalize the term harm. And the second problem is that in the real world, you always end up harming some things and you always end up having trade-offs. It's not a question of absolutes. It's a question of what is a bigger harm. Uh, and morality is really about the lesser of, of, of the harms. And we don't know how we handle that. We don't know how to formalize that. The second problem I want to mention is one of AI sentience. So will AGI be a sentient entity, something like an animal, something that's worth worthy of protection and of looking after the interest of? Will it suffer? If it suffers, uh, it, it behooves us to take its interest into consideration, just like we are supposed to take interest of, of animals and other sentient beings into consideration. Um, is it worth arguing about sentience? I think it is, and I'll tell you why. Uh, I don't think it's worth arguing about consciousness. In fact, I think it's impossible to argue about it because consciousness is not a phenomenon that's open to scientific uh, study. Uh, it is a subjective phenomena, inherently subjective. It's not something you can share measurements on. Um, intelligence is a phenomena that is open to measurement, but it's also extremely open to different definitions. So it's kind of pointless to argue about whether something is intelligent or not, because it depends on your definition of intelligence. And once you set a definition, the, the question becomes not so difficult to answer. But intentionality and sentience are different. Um, one way in which they're different is because we are built, we evolve to uh, recognize sentience and to relate to it appropriately. So you can think about it as our tendency to anthropomorphize, but it's not just anthropomorphizing. We look at animals, uh, at least the higher animals, and we can relate to them. And we know when they are, you know, when they behave in certain ways, we recognize either rightly or wrongly certain mental states. I think it will become impossible for us to resist anthropomorphizing good AGI. Whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, I mean, I showed the example earlier where it's a good thing, when it's trying to help you, um, but it could, of course, be a very bad thing as well. I want to point out, um, as my last comment, uh, fundamental differences between um, what I call evolutionary intelligence. You can call it natural intelligence, but I don't want to use the term natural because in my mind, um, AGI is also natural. It's just, it's man-made, but it's, it's part of nature. Uh, the, distinct, the important distinction I want to make here is between intelligence as it evolved through natural selection and evolution in, in humans and in other animals versus uh, intelligence as it um, developed by people in, in the last couple of decades and maybe in the next couple of decades. Evolutionary intelligence arose either after the presence of emotions or together with emotions. Whereas in contrast, AGI values and goals are programmed. That's a fundamental difference. Another fundamental difference that I wish that was discussed more in the literature is the fact that evolutionary intelligence, namely our own natural intelligence, is embodied in a single body, in a single memory, which is present in a single time and place at any one time and place. Uh, and therefore, it gives rise to this notion of identity. We maybe have a hard time defining identity, but we know what we mean by we say that we are and we have an identity uh, as individuals and it's not transferable to somebody else. Would AGI have an identity? If you can take an AGI and make multiple copies of it, then where is the identity? If you made multiple copies and you let them have different experiences, the, the identity will diverge. But what if you then merge their experiences? Uh, when you think of interacting with an AGI, um, you should think about, you're not interacting with a body that's sitting with you, you're interacting with something that's throughout the world because it can have sensors anywhere in the world. In fact, it could be talking with 9 billion other people on the planet at the same time and learning in parallel from all of them. It could be fast forwarded, it could be rewounded, it could be duplicated, it could be uh, um, frozen, shelved and restarted. What does that do to a sense of identity? Incidentally, this problem is not because it's artificial. Um, if we could copy brains, and there's plenty of science fiction on doing that, if we could understand brains and start them and stop them uh, and duplicate them and reconstruct them, uh, we would have the same problem. 
but that never happened in evolutionary intelligence and is it comes you know as part of the package with agi let me stop here uh, we have a whopping two minutes left for questions So there are many, many questions in the chat, Roni. Um, so um, would you like me to leave you to like pick one that sounds particularly attractive to you or shall I pick one? I have, you should, because I have not had a chance to look at the chat and you did, so it'll save us time. Okay, um, I, I, there's a lot of chatter going on now about the autonomous weapons issue, uh, whether or not they actually already exist. Um, so maybe it's too late. Uh, uh, you know, whether there's any solution to keeping them from uh, coming about. Uh, and also, um, how could you really, I guess you've already pointed to, and this is just a related point, um, the Asimov principles, you know, if we don't agree on harm, uh, you know, how does that extend also to this idea of the autonomous weapons? I don't think I have anything wise to say. Uh, as to the second, uh, the first issue, uh, I don't know. Uh, I, I think that um, some autonomous weapons are probably being developed everywhere. So uh, the, the, the tragedy of the commons of, of the race is that any one country um, that decides to not develop autonomous weapons has to worry about other countries developing them. Um, and that's the sort of prisoner's dilemma kind of um, problem. Uh, I, I don't have a good solution for it. And I have no idea if countries are developing I would I would have to presume that they are. Um, so one more one more question before you go then, and then we'll transition to our panel. And that is, uh, what advice do you have about developing benchmarks that would allow us to really get a handle on what the capabilities are of these models? That's a funny question. I, I actually tried to do a little bit of that uh, in the last few weeks. Um, I try to uh, find a foolproof way of uh, making uh, ChatGPT4 fail. Um, and I think other people have tried uh, different uh, different things, but I'll tell you about my experience. So um, I told it, um, you know, if A implies B and B implies C, does A imply C? And it said yes. In fact, it gave me a whole page explanation, and I, I had to tell it just 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 say yes or no. Um, and then uh, I said, okay, if A implies B and B implies not C, and uh, Q implies not F, and F implies J does A imply J? Uh, and there it failed. Uh, so when I took away the ABC, um, the nice ABC thread, because that's what I figured it'll find in, in the internet, on the internet, and I added in the negation, and I scrambled the order of the, um, of the atoms of the different contributions, it failed. Um, Another way in which many people discovered that it fails, if you give it two large numbers to multiply, it will get the first couple of digits right and the last couple of digits right, but it'll get the middle wrong, right? So I, I, I like to call it sort of the kryptonite of ChatGPT, and I would love to come up with a, a whole set of them, and maybe other people have already done that, uh, of things that are inherently difficult for it um, as a way of, uh, of poking exactly what you said, poking, you know, what does it not do right? Great. Uh, this was wonderful, Ronnie. Thank you so much for spending time with us. I think that your way of laying out the, you know, some of the potential positive things that could come out of this, some of the potential concerns that we need to think about will be a great foundation for the hackathons that we're about to launch um, so that people can take these ideas and instead of, uh, you know, just losing sleep over it, um, can actually kind of start to do something about it together. We wanted this to be a community of people talking to each other, sharing their different perspectives and working together. And hopefully we'll see a lot of that. So thanks so much, Roni. Um, and now we will uh, move to our panel. Yeah, thanks, Kelly. Yes, let's give Roni a round of applause. Thank you. Great. Okay. I um, am going to go ahead and uh, share my screen again. Um, so that we can move into the Ask Me Anything uh, panel. Um, we've been collecting questions already for the Ask Me Anything panel, and we have divided them into themes, and that will structure our discussion. But we'd like to continue to collect these questions. And um, in addition to continuing your discussion in the chat, 
If you want to go ahead and use this bit.ly CMU AMA link, you can go ahead and submit um, some questions there uh, as well. And that there's also uh, an opportunity there to indicate that you'd like to um, be part of our uh, Slack community. And we've uh, had about 70 people already indicate that they're interested in being part of that. And it's a great way to continue the discussion uh, between sessions and uh, find other people um, that you might want to collaborate with. Um, so now we'll move into the Ask Me Anything panel. Um, I have here uh, with us today three of my colleagues who, uh, along with me, were part of the 2018-2019 AAAS um, cohort uh, of the Leshner Leadership Institute for Public Engagement with Science. That was the year that the theme was artificial intelligence. That was the summer that GPT-3 came out. And at that time, we started to talk together about um, the hype that we saw in the in the media at that time, which was nothing in comparison to what we're seeing now uh, with GPT-4. And so this is our chance now to bring communities together for discussion. In some ways, we already started to talk about um, doing something like this that summer. And so I'm excited to see that come to fruition. And I'm happy that three of my colleagues out of 15 in the cohort um, have um, uh, come uh, to be part of this panel. And so um, this will be our opportunity to um, introduce each one. They, um, they have one uh, intro slide and then we'll do Q&A. Uh, so the first person who I will call onto the stage as it were is Nicholas Mate. Assistant Professor at Tulane University. Nicholas, can you uh, unmute yourself and um, introduce yourself with this slide? Yeah, for sure. Thanks for uh, inviting me. I'm happy to, to be here today. Um, I'm an Assistant Professor at Tulane University. I spent some time at IBM and some time at some other places doing a lot of sort of AI optimization um, type, type uh, consulting and, and research. Um, I've recently, recently finished up a book on uh, computing and technology ethics, uh, how to teach that, especially to uh, undergraduates and practitioners, um, engaging through science fiction, and actually picking up on a lot of the themes uh, that Roni um, sort of pitched in his talk. Um, I think I think Roni had a, a very a variance of my last point here, which is a uh, you know, or my first point, which is like, uh, you know, this has all happened before, and this has all happened again, right? Like technology and society are really. Uh, bound up in this like sort of un inseparable dissociable like conversation right like that we sort of create new things um we integrate those into and they are you know come from both what we've had before and where we're going right and so i think it's really important to contextualize a lot of these changes um in the in the in the way that uh you know things are things are going so uh, i don't want to take up too much time i want to get to the panel so i'll uh throw it back to carolyn to uh introduce the rest of the panel Perfect, thank you. Oops, we skipped over. Biplav Srivastava, professor at the University of South Carolina. Uh, can you unmute yourself and go ahead and introduce yourself, Biplav? Uh, sure. Uh, thanks, Carolyn, and uh, the team for inviting me. Uh, I'm Biplav Srivastava. I'm a professor at the University of South Carolina. And before that, I spent two decades at uh, IBM and, uh, and many other places. So my experience has been in building systems. And what I want to just put on the table is that uh, society's problems are solved by people, not by technology alone. So if we throw up fancy technology at anything and we expect that problem to solve, that doesn't happen. Uh, for example, we can't make anyone to talk to us if we don't want to talk, no matter what the technology. And uh, there are important things. The distinction have to be respected as a society norm like uh, respecting the dead versus alive, right? And live versus recorded, that kind of thing. Uh, and, and finally, um, I would like to just say that generative AI is great because I get to talk to a lot of people, including my mother-in-law who was asking me questions about it and I could explain it. So I think this is a great opportunity. I'm very excited, but it is also one where uh, we need to move with the caution. So more during the panel, thanks. Great. Yeah, it's funny you should mention that. Uh, I was just talking to my parents about uh, about Tom's keynote, <laughs> and uh, normally I wouldn't uh, have the opportunity to do that. Okay, and our final panelist, John Zimmerman. Hi, I'm John. I'm a professor at the HCI Institute. Uh, my background is in design, and for the last 25 years, I've been working on how to take 
advances in AI and situate them in the world in ways that people experience as valuable and meaningful. Okay, great. Uh, so that was, uh, you guys are so nice and timely. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and we're going to move into the panel. Nicole, can you please uh, configure the screen? Uh, so we'll be ready. Um, and uh, I am bringing up my notes. Um, so we have divided the uh, the comments and questions that people have um, submitted into several different themes, and they're very synergistic with the um, issues that Roni raised in his talk. And um, so I think that we will um, we'll start with some very high level um, themes. Um, so uh, there's a lot of fear out in the media about uh, you know things that that could happen, and and Roni raised um, some of those as well um, in his discussion about uh, autonomous weapons and so forth. Um, I guess my question for you, panel, would be how how should we actually orient ourselves towards these potential harms and potential. Um, positive impacts. You know, people talked about losing sleep. Um, I think losing sleep in general is is probably not very healthy. So how can we have a healthy orientation towards all of this, especially as we're bombarded uh, by the media? Who wants to join, jump in first? Uh, if you're okay, Caroline, I can just jump in first. Sure. Okay. Uh, I have to um, put on the table that, um, you know, no technology alone has solved anything. Okay, whether it was cars, planes, um, or vaccination, any anything you pick up, uh, just by uh, uh, new research has come out, it was not enough. What we needed was a combination of things, uh, including education uh, to the user. Uh, uh, we of course needed research. We needed productization, and we also needed regulation. Everything has a place in there, uh, in the product chain. So, in in the case of generative AI, which has come out. Uh, people are thinking about throwing everything at technology. And I think that is one thing which we need to keep uh, uh, in mind that uh, only technology is not the answer to anything in the past and probably will not be anything in the future. Thanks. Great. Uh, John, would you like to comment? Uh, sure. I think uh, the idea of autonomous weapons, I'm going to kind of build on what Roni said and say, actually, these already exist, but I think we can expand our definition of weapon to really be anything that's causing harm. So if I'm using a, um, autonomous bots to reply to messages on Twitter to drive an agenda, that is totally an automated weapon. Um, we tend to think of it in a very militaristic sense, but I actually think the weapons we should be more fearful of our ones that are attacking economies, um, information, and sort of working on the psychological aspects of people. I guess um, adding just a little skin to that question, um, uh, when you look out in the media and you see the uh, potential harms projected out, does it um, do you get the sense that there, there might also be um, a way that people might be smarter consumers of these fears? So how can people um, get more grounded in what's actually realistic? I know that Roni said that his view is that it's hard to predict what might happen, but where does that leave us as humans, um, especially those who are not in the field of AI uh, reading the media? Um, what are some tips? Should we just believe what we read? What do you think? <laughs> um, I think this is this is one of these. This is kind of an age old question, right? Like, so if you you know taken sort of a history course, a long enough history course, you remember like the age of sort of yellow journalism, where you know there was lots of newspapers that I mean started part of the Spanish American War um, because they were sort of disinformation. They were making stuff up, right? Like, there's there's been this cycle of you know. I think the disinformation part is, 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 is tricky, right? It's, you know, I remember when I was, you know, going through school, you know, we couldn't use Wikipedia because it was on the internet and like everyone could edit it. And now it's one of these like authoritative voices, right? So I think going back to Biplov and going back to this, these idea of, you know, socio-technical systems, you know, there's a whole bunch of research around this is, you know, really 
thinking about the whole pipeline, but you're right. Like, how do we as individuals kind of think about these things? And you got to be, you know, it's the same way that when you get the, the scammy phone call, right? Like you're, you're a little bit worried about these things. And I, I think it is forcing us to reconsider the risks um, of engaging on the internet, the risks of engaging with a random phone call that could be an automated voice, you know, backed up by chat GPT. Um, a lot of times, you know, my, my grandfather gets all these phone calls from, you know, call centers in third world countries. Like we're already doing this with people. We're going to start doing this even at even larger scales, see this at larger scales with, with some of this technology. And I think a lot of the same habits that we've, we've sort of cultivated about like checking your sources and things like that, like really, you know, we kind of double down on here. Right. Um, and it's, it's, it's just kind of this encroachment of what can be fake um, and how democratize the ability and Roni picked up on this, you know, democratize the ability of creating fake things has gotten, you know, we're not worried about like one bad newspaper anymore. We're worried about, you know, a thousand different points um, where these things can happen. But a lot of the techniques that we've developed, you know, sensationalism, you know, looking for, you know, badly photoshopped things, you know, stuff like that. Like there's a lot of those techniques that we already have. I think we, we have a lot of the tools. Um, and I think a lot of the concern is really around the volume um, or, of these things. And I, I, I don't have good answers for that. Um, but it is, you know, I think we're, we're all equipped, you know, we've, we've read bad stories, you know, we've, we've seen fake images where there's like a sixth finger coming off somebody like, you know, we have these ideas of how to, how to pick these things out. Um, and I think those tools are going to continue to serve us well for quite some time. So Carolyn, uh, oh, go ahead, be five. Yeah, I wanted to just ground the question in an example. And I have been working with um, uh, how um, in election setting, right, we can drive voter engagement. There is a lot which is talked about bad information, but not a lot is talked about good information. So good information is where is my polling place? Where is the, when is the election? How do I vote? Things like this, right? Now, any of election agency in the world, it is supposed to put this information out and they do. They do put it on frequently asked question and all these things on their websites. When we went and took that and we asked people, what kind of questions do you want to know? Okay. And of the five, six categories that they want to know, they want to know about the place, the time, the, the uh, candidates and so on. Only a few categories are available. So what's happening is agencies are giving opportunities for missing information, right? Which needs to be filled in from other places. And we don't give so much the same kind of uh, push or importance to good information that we give to bad information. This is about the information economy. This is the information asymmetry and so on, right? So why blame technology for everything? In fact, we have been doing studies on how people perceive first-time voters, uh, people with cognitive background, and even us, right, who vote a lot, but then you realize that, look, there are changes. So even going into deep into a use case, how can we improve um, voting if that's our aim in any democracy, then if you drill down and we figure out, so we gave the same question to chat GPT. We said, here is a fact, FAQ, only answer from there. And the smart tool tried to paraphrase and give the wrong information, okay? Even when I tell you, just use these 10 things and don't give me anything else, right? It will try to paraphrase, try be intelligent and give wrong information. So my point is that, we need to be more stricter with our acceptance of technology. Don't accept everything. Mm -hmm. Make sure we don't give room. When, when you are mandated to give right information, please give the right information, okay? And, and, and the third thing is, of course, we need better technology. I'm not saying that uh, we, we get to give up them a pass, but it is everything coming together. And if you just put new tools, it will all, the media is talking about bad information only, right? It is not talking about good information. Please escalate and improve the impact of good information. That's great. Um, I think if I would summarize your message very briefly, it's about the human responsibility in all of this. Um, and I think that that goes a long way towards addressing some of the fear um, that uh, we're not victims here. Um, we have a role to play in all of this, in shaping sure. all of this. Um, and in some ways, we've been saying since the advent of Web 2.0, you have to be really careful, consumers of everything that you read, understanding the process by which it's getting posted, who it's being posted by, how it's being vetted, but not everybody took that seriously. And maybe this is really our wake up call instead of just being afraid to really just not be lazy, let's just really take our role in um, 
you know, being smart and careful uh, consumers. So okay. I, I want to yes, go ahead, John. This. Go ahead, John. Yes. Um, because if we use the metaphor of food, we don't have to say, wow, is this can of soup going to kill me? <laughs> right. Be, um, because we use regulation and policy to take away like effort from consumers. That is an unnecessary effort. There's a degree of just safety that should be ensured. And that's really the role of government. And part of the problem in the AI space uh, is a lack of regulation and a lack of, I would say, re AI researcher engagement in the co-creation of technology and regulation simultaneously. We, like we know yeah. we're making things that are potentially bad. So just one quick example, it's totally not AI, but a colleague of mine did a project at Stanford on smoking cessation. That eventually turned into the company Juul that was totally focused on getting teens addicted to nicotine, right? Like, Great idea. You could see where this would go that was bad, but we don't have a way of putting guardrails on the things we're creating. And I feel like as a research community, we need to be investigating how we can do that. Yeah, I would, I would push back just a little bit, John, um, just in terms of like, you know, there, there's some of these conferences, right? There's FAC, there's, there's some of these conferences that are pushing into this space, right? And I think a lot of, the, I think folks from HCI, I think are really in public health, especially are much more in tune with the space than, than sort of the traditional sort of siloed AI research has been, right? Like, and I, and I completely agree with the, the overall point, right? Which is that it's a conversation between regulation and you've seen this through the Bitcoin phase, you've seen this through, through over and over is, is this engagement. And I think as these products have, have become more salient, like, you know, across society, you know, that there has been a need from of CS to, to move from sort of this sort of applied math, like purely research into these engineering product type type operations, which, you know, before us, like civil engineering, you know, mechanical engineering, like the more developed engineering practice fields have a much bigger and a much longer history of doing. And I think what you're seeing right now is a lot of this tension between sort of bringing a lot of this CS research into market in ways that are more responsible, right? Like if you look, you know, this is again, quoting from, you know, talking about stuff we did for the book, like looking at the history of professionalization within a lot of these industries, it occurs because of these big moments, right? Like the whole idea of like, you know, civil engineering review and things like this happened because of several like massive bridge failures. And it's like, oh, wait, we need to actually pay attention to how these things are affecting folks. And I totally agree with, you know, a lot of the stuff that you're saying. I think one thing that's important and maybe kind of hard for us as, you know, researchers and developers is, you know, we don't want to necessarily fall into this, like uh, what I think uh, Jasanoff calls the, the techno solutionism, right? Like the answer to every technological problem is not more technology necessarily. Maybe it is, but, you know, there is, you know, space to have conversations, to have regulations and that, and, you know, to sort of believe in these like democratic ideals of, of self-governance and, and, you know, things like that. So I think really leaning into that space and, and as sort of, you know, CS folks like kind of move more into that space. I think it's a, it's a something we're struggling with, but it's something that, that, that this road has been tread before, right? It's been tread before by other disciplines. And I think we need to take those best practices and really, you know, actually believe in them. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I'll point out that these issues of policy came up a number of times in questions that people have posted to the chat today and also um, have submitted ahead of time. Um, and I, I sort of feel like the tenor of the conversation, though, is um, if we're worried about guardrails, the answer is there needs to be policy. But in some ways, um, that uh, gives the government a lot of power in this space. Uh, are we sure that, that um, we want to just defer? Um, I think that there are also some voices around the table that are not necessarily trusting that 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 that's the answer. Um, and I think there's a role for many of us to play uh, in all that. And some people are also asking um, to the extent that we want uh, the general public to be active in conversation with uh, policymakers. It, um, should there be some mandated education about uh, the technology that would make it, um, you know, more functional for more of a society to be involved in all of this. So how do you see the multiple stakeholders coming together for these guardrails? Or do we really just think that we should defer to policymakers? 
So, Carolyn, um, I would like to just uh, uh, answer this question, taking off from what Nick was saying, okay, that uh, engineering, with, as applied to physical goods, like bridges, planes, cars, and so on, they are tested very well, okay? There are uh, standards, and, and standards have developed over time, okay? You may call them uh, regulation, but they are like industry standards and all that, okay? In contrast to that, software testing and software and hardware system testing is a joke, okay? It is a joke in the sense that every three month or six month, if you are getting an update, okay, that product was not designed well. You don't get an upgrade on a bridge every three months, okay? Uh, you have planes which are flying 20 years, right? You go to a Boeing uh, 400, whatever, a mega top uh, Singapore Airlines used to say, and I was surprised it was 20 year old plane and it was great, okay? So my point is, we need to, if we want uh, AI, uh, people want their systems to be used in everyday things, it has to be better engineered, okay? Our hardware is st still better uh, tested. Our software is not. How many papers can you find on Google map uh, verification? How good is it, right? How many papers can you find on chatbot testing? It, we, we do what is called technical evaluation, okay? Perplexity, those kind of uh, technical um, uh, metrics. We do what I can call business metric, which will be like 10% improvement, but we don't do long-term impact like an AB study or randomized control trial, which we put for our vaccinations and vaccines and other things. So our testing has to improve. And I think if the regulation is just telling us improve your testing, it's just telling the obvious, okay? So we, first we need to look inside and say, how good are we doing compared to our peers in other form places of engineering? And only then we can say, no, don't do it over-regulation. Just do basic engineering first. That's what I'll tell my own community. Yeah, I think this raises another question I'm hearing um, in our various uh, information uh, and question gathering efforts. And that is, uh, you know, things are changing so fast. I think you're right. Uh, Biplav people have pointed out the missing science in terms of evaluation. It's a huge active area, for example, um, in all um, areas of technology, how do you evaluate fairness? How do you evaluate bias? How do you do these audits to make sure that these aspects are not a danger? And um, so there are processes in place. There are already discussions about policy. And yet, like I said, there's a missing science. But then what does that mean in terms of how we're absorbing the technology as it changes? Can Should we wait? I've heard some people say, okay, can we put the brakes on? Do we even have the ability to do that? Um, so, uh, you know, respecting what you said, Viplav, how do we move forward from here, though? Um, because the research needs to happen. Um, and in the, uh, in the meantime, the technology is out on the table. So I'll just make a quick comment and then let, let my panelists uh, say, uh, which is that um, I, I think... Um, we would be, as, as AI researchers, right, we would be terribly arrogant if we think that we can remove all the bias and fairness in the world, okay? And as I made my point that uh, people solve people's problems, not technology alone. So our intent to remove fairness in the society, right, has to be higher. And then we can, and, and, and we are moving in that direction. It's not that we are not moving in that direction. And then, of course, we, we need to remove it, that we need more research. but before we do that, we also need to communicate bias and fairness issues to our society. So in my own research in the past four or five years, we have been working on how can you measure and communicate, not remove. Remediation and all is good, but that's a socio-technical problem. You need the social input also. But communication, you need technical as well as people from mass communication and so on. So we need to, of course, tie technology with uh, uh, humanities, but communicating and then trying to remove has been one of our approaches. But regardless of the method, what I'm trying to say is that if the intent is there to remove, and which I think is slowly and slowly building, we will find the tools. And we need to take a multi-stakeholder uh, approach, but also with the humility that others have also solved it. My work in Smarter Cities has told me that people are already very smart, okay? As computer scientists, we go in, we provide another tool in the box, but don't think that you have the new evaluation method or so on. 
people in that area, like whether it is water, transportation, election, whichever area I've worked in, they already have the evaluation mechanisms. Just listen to it and see how you can embed your methods into it. Would other uh, panelists like to jump in? I was going to let John go. I haven't heard from him in a minute. <laughs> no, I, I really like what, what Biff have said. Uh, yeah, I totally agree. Okay. I think you know, I, I got one one like small pushback there though. I mean, so like there's a there's a great paper from fact that's like you know 60 years of fairness, right? So it's it's a lot of these you know statistical measures of fairness things like these are things people have have observed before, um, and we're observing them again, right? Like this, and and I think really doubling down on what the bluff says is you know we we've we've known for many many years that like uh, SAT tests are horribly biased, right? Like that they have unfair outcomes, that there is un you know that there are uh, disparate impacts of those tests on admissions and things like that, but we continue to use them, right? So it's not something, and I completely agree with Bob, it's not something that we're going to solve as CS folks. I think this is where we really, you know, we're not going to fix this problem. Um, but I think, you know, really doubling down on like understanding how those things creep into the systems that we make and then participating in the conversation of how those systems are applied. I think some of the biggest concerns around fairness and bias and things like that is a lot of these systems like some of the recidivism software um, that ProPublica was really out there about was you know these these systems are applied to communities who are not a part of their creation who don't have the ability to voice their concerns and are being disparately impacted by these things right and so it's not like some you know measure of positive verity is going to fix the overall applications of these things, right? And so that's again getting back to where the the answer is not necessarily a technical fix. The answer is how do we apply these systems to communities, right? And that these technical tools are one part of these larger systems that I think we're we're becoming more honest about. We're becoming more honest about like what the impacts of these things could be and recognizing those. But we have to work with those communities, um, and that's a big part of some of the stuff that we're trying to do here with community engaged AI is like you know, going and, and talking to the people who are going to be impacted by these systems. What are their concerns? Because I think all too often we sit back and we just say, oh, I'm sure it'll be fine. Because everybody that kind of looks like me or talks like me or knows as much as I do, uh, they all seem to think this is a good idea, right? Um, and you, you're not going to solve that problem um, sitting back. Yeah, I think that's really a great point about um, definitely getting out of our own little comfort zones and um, getting to know uh, more broadly how technology is viewed and interacted with by different um, uh, groups of, of people. I know in my own area of educational technology that there have been huge uh, fears of technology in the classroom um, because of some uh, particular kinds of dangers disproportionately potentially affecting um, some uh, groups other uh, opposed to others. And while I acknowledge those things, it seems like a real shame uh, knowing that the positive side that is is more or less, you know, sometimes in these discussions being ignored and how how do you bring all that together is a big question. And I think some of that is going to come up on the panel next week, which focuses on education and the future of work, just to put in a little uh, plug for all of that. And we have a, a variety of uh, speakers from different perspectives who I think will amplify some of the issues that are coming up today and contextualize it specifically um, in, in that issue. Um, some people in the chat are asking, what would AI law even look like? And I know as Leshner Fellows, we all had some interactions with Congress people and congressional committees um, and talking about uh, you know, some of these issues at that time. And I think it was enlightening to us to kind of get a more of a sense of of, of how policy gets made, but also some of the challenges um, just because of different spheres of influence and expertise coming together. Um, so uh, what do you all um, imagine so, uh, would well, be a way this could play out positively? John. I wanna jump on that. Super excited about this question. Uh, I think it's often just, it's not an AI law, but it's expanding yes. rules that we currently have. So right now we have like libel laws, which uh, prevent people from saying untrue bad things about other people. You, But we don't really have laws about putting out misinformation that moves an agenda we care about, right? That's kind of not illegal. 
uh, but it's creating a different kind of harm. So like building, um, if you're thinking about a deception when I'm pretending to be a human, we have laws about false advertising, but they're narrowly scoped, uh, but in a commercial space, but it's like only the commercial act of advertising versus um, false commercial practice, you might say. So I, I think we actually have things in place and it's not fundamentally about AI itself. AI is just a mechanism that just makes it easier to do these things. So it's creating new opportunities for bad behaviors, but we already have a lot of regulation that sort of scoped out harmful spaces and it's often just expanding it to now cover opportunities AI has created. I would I, I second a lot of what John was saying. I mean, there's I don't think there's an AI law per se to be done, but there are plenty of, of, of rules and regulations on how we do advertising. You see what ended up happening with Facebook with their their advertising um, lawsuit, which they were not guilty of. I think they settled. Um, but that was a long effort by um, a, a lot of, of people to sort of figure out how these tools were being applied. Right. So we we, we have rules about advertising for housing, for credit, for credit approval, for things like this, right? And it's, it's, it doesn't matter if the thing that's evaluating your credit is an AI or some random dude who's making terrible judgments, right? Like it's about understanding and, and regulating what these impacts are. And that's generally how these things are, are, are kind of framed. Um, because AI, and I, again, I don't want to, I mean, I know this is the generative AI talk, but like a lot of this is about, you know, the uh, general computing technologies, general interconnections between these things and, and layering these, these AI sort of decision layers on top of them. But there's still a lot of impact from these like large systems that just come from them. And it's, it's, you know, I think trying to say, oh, well, AI shouldn't do X is maybe, and again, I'm not a lawyer, I don't want to pretend to be a lawyer. Um, but it's really understanding, you know, where the applications area, application areas are. And I think john really picked up on that as like, we have it for like a business. But then what does it mean you know, that we've moved into this sort of democratized space where anyone can sort of participate in these tools, anyone can generate fake images, anyone can generate this, this text and, and, and how do we sort of go after that? It's not, a, it's not something we have a good answer for, right? Like I was pointing out before, you know, these, these fake phone calls, these, these sort of aggressive uh, text messaging and phishing email, you know, it's, it's these point efforts that we have more trouble with um, from a regulatory perspective. Um, so. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, especially because I, you know, I imagine it's already happening. Lots of startup companies, and and there will be more. Uh, and so, so, and, and so, in addition to the huge companies who are very active in this space, there are some questions in the chat and some questions that came up also in the questions that people had submitted ahead of time. Thinking about the future, and also. What is driving the direction that this is all going to take? Um, there, there's a concern about um, what are the motives that drive industry and how much control will that have on the future of where this goes? And as a community, what can we do to uh, help steer? Um, what, what do people think on that front? So, um, Carolyn, um, I would like to... Um connect one uh, quick thing with the law and then back to this question, which is that there, uh, as you know, in uh, fairness and bias, there's a lot of definitions and all that, but there's an excellent paper from Partnership on AI, which basically says that many of these definitions, they don't actually uh, map to anything which is in legal parlance, right? Um, so like the individual fairness or group fairness, uh, those things are not there in the law. In law, there is has to be someone who has to be harmed and then only you can actually do something. So even the formulation of what is fair, right, has to be legally aligned. That was the key point. And that connects back uh, to the question, which is the power of the big companies and small companies. Okay. So what happens is uh, today, the reason um, we are getting the progress in AI and why it is centralized with the large companies is because of, uh, if you break this down, it is compute, it is data, Big companies are not working on data, okay? The data is all, everyone is taking it from Wikipedia and all that, okay, public sources. Uh, it is compute. And then it is a lot of uh, um, manpower, okay? So the, the thing is to break um, and, and uh, democratize it, we need definitions which are practical, others they, which reduce the entry barrier, okay? And 
yes, if that doesn't happen, then big companies con uh, concentrate and uh, you need more transparency. You need more transparency in data, in terms of the definition, in what is need uh, needed. Uh, as a small startup, right? If my students or me or others, right, want to do something and actually deliver an innovative thing in the world, there should be an easy path to do it with as little dependence. So standards actually help us in democratizing. That's what uh, has been shown, uh, technology after technology. So we need more standards. We need open uh, transparency. And if federal fundings are being used, then more of the things should be made available. Evaluation should be free. And those are the ways you actually can make uh, uh, technologies open for others to contribute. Any other panelists want to jump in on that? I mean, I think we have some of this, right? Like there's been sort of the recent NSF, uh, you know, there's there's been a lot more push toward open data from NSF funded research um, and, and availability of publications. So I think we're, I mean, we're, we're moving in those directions, right? Um, but the system, you know, and the systems are, are becoming aligned. I, Karen, I gotta be honest, I lost track of the original question at this point. <laughs> it, um, so one of the, uh, there's a question about what it what it is or should be the driving force. Um, is there, uh, it, it, you know, obviously industry has, as, uh, you know, uses a profit motive, uh, you know, to help guide things um, and, you know, what people will pay for um, ends up having a big influence on the direction. Um, but are we powerless to help shape that? What are ways that we um, can curb um, those forces and actually shape the future of where this is going? It looked like John was going to jump in and say something. Uh, so I'm going to say we're powerless. Um... <laughs> Uh, probably not what you want to hear, but I, I feel like we're at end stage capitalism. Like we've created the tools that let us optimize capitalism to draw out its worst aspects. And so maybe this is also a push for us to evolve to whatever comes after capitalism. And, and you know, like this didn't always exist. It won't always exist but we're, we're caught. Um, and in, in general, the sort of things people do with AI that create harm are almost all motivated by capitalism underneath or sort of pursuit of power. These are not changes in human behavior, right? But I think as a computer scientist, yes, we are powerless because you have to act. It's not about the technology. It's like it, yeah, it's like now about people and behavior. And so that we need other mechanisms to start to shape people's behavior with the technology. So um, you're speaking as a technology developer to say that we're powerless um, to create technology that solves this problem, but uh, that's one we. Is there another we though? We as a as a community, um, what is our way of taking a stand um, if we're concerned? Um, I mean, there, so obviously there's a you know so one 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 way. I'm not I'm not necessarily advocating this, but of course there are boycotts. That's one way to <laughs> say you know companies are putting out stuff um and we're going to take their power away from them if we were very organized and we were committed to doing that we could make that happen um so uh, it, that may not be practical that may not be um desirable but it's one way what um you know what should we be doing and i actually you know along these lines there was a whole series of questions advice like this that people posted in the ahead of time. What do you guys think? I want to hit on specifically what you said. Yeah, you can protest, but I, I would say like in totally US context, we have many mobile phone providers. All of them are terrible. <laughs> you can say there are many airlines you can choose to fly. All of them will treat you terribly unless you fly business class and then you're just treated semi-terribly. That. <laughs> That, yeah, you can pick on a specific company, but the sort of cross-industry practices are totally driven from a capitalistic point of view of like, what will I get people to like 
minimally tolerate and they follow each other. And so like single whittling one out doesn't actually change that same bad behavior from other participants in the industry. And, you know, and to some degree, the companies have a focus 24 seven with professionals applied to it to um, extract value in the space that they are. When you're functioning as a consumer, being a consumer isn't a thing that consumes you, right? You're not a professional consumer that's optimizing your behavior. You're just sort of surviving in the world in which you find yourself. So I, again, I feel like it's a power dynamic where we need to return power away from those that have data, those that have data centers. Uh, and I think Roni was kind of hitting on this, like kind of an amazing thing about AI is that it's just scarily available to all kinds of people that are not a government or not a country, um, but that's both its, its um, strength and the most frightening aspect of it at the same time. John, you're going to put me in the uh, the position of trying to defend capitalism here, but I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to take the bait on the on the panel. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, um, but I think I think John, you kind of hit on one of the things that um, some of the work that we've been thinking about is is we've talked to a lot of community partners. I think the the thing is, and this gets back to Carolyn, what you were saying, like a lot of these systems require data. A lot of that data is generated by us, right? And I think one of the concerns that we see when we've done some of our community group focuses, especially here in New Orleans with some, you know, cultural uh, Mardi Gras Indians and some of these other like culture centers, um, is they have data that they are they might give, but they don't see value coming back to them, right? And this is the same idea. There's a great article um, about I think the Maori people in New Zealand. You know, it was a low what's typically called a low resource language. We can discuss whether or not that's a problematic term. Um, but they sort of went in and collected all the data to, to make these chatbots work better for Maori. And then uh, one of the big companies comes along and says, oh, that's great, can we have your data? And they said, no, right? And so I think one of the things that we can do to sort of pull back is not, you know, the data, the, everything that they're using on the, these AI tools are built on is data from us. It's our feedback to JetGPT, it's all this other stuff. And the question is, is what is the value proposition that we're getting back from those? And to a lot of communities, that value proposition is not strong enough. Um, and tools, I think there's a lot of tools about, you know, how do you retain ownership of your data? There's the sort of have I been trained thing, you know, stuff like that. Like, how do you, as a data producer, you know, make sure that you're being, you know, uh, compensated correctly for the inputs that you're giving to these systems. There was a great lawsuit, I think, when Waze went public in Israel, there was one guy who had like done all this mapping stuff for him. And then they sort of told him, eh, whatever, you gave it to him for free, right? So that's, I think it gets back to John, what you're saying, this power dynamic, and how do we return, you know, some of the power over this data um, to individuals? And this is a conversation that we had before. We had this conversation um, during the rise of Facebook, during the rise of like uh, sort of web 2.0 type things is what is that interaction with data? And unfortunately we like cons as consumers, we sort of lost. Um, but maybe this is, you know, going back to my techno solutionism uh, thing, maybe this is someplace where we can, you know, actually think about the tools and the techniques for how do we claim and retain ownership of those data. And somebody in the chat has sort of pointed it out. Like, you know, I think, uh, I forget who the quote came from, but GDPR is being like the most significant piece of AI legislation, right? Because it's about, this data ownership question, um, which is, I think, is a really central question to this exploitation versus exploitation, exploration, exploitation, you know, uh, thing that that folks feel sort of bound up in. It's like they have to give their data, but they're, what, what is what is what is being returned to them? Um, my favorite joke that I like to give though here is like, if I asked you, you know, what you would pay for your Google account. You know, just like the maps, the real-time traffic, you know, all of these things. Like we do extract, this is my push, this is my capitalism pushback, John. I'm gonna make it very short. Uh, you know, we do get a lot of value from these things, right? Like I cannot, I cannot remember the number of times that Google has kept me out of traffic jams because they have my location data, but they're returning something valuable to me um, as, a, as a consumer, right? So this is the, the tension in all of these things, right? It's like our, to make sure that we, as consumers and you know, people who are using these technologies are getting that value in, in meaningful ways to us. Yeah, just to put in a plug for a future uh, one of these meetings later in the summer, Jill Lehman, who's there in the audience, I see, is going to be giving us uh, a talk. And I know that these issues of data ownership, 
um, and the positive and negative sides of turning over your data and um, the commoditization of all of that is going to be a topic of that discussion. So I think we'll continue to uh, come back to these really important issues. But in the chat, somebody asked a question, since we're sort of framing this in terms of capitalism or not in this discussion, I wonder how biased we are from a kind oh. of American perspective. Somebody raised the issue. What does that mean about how these things will play out in other places that are decidedly not capitalists, like China, for example? Um, uh, you know, and, and, and the fact that this is a worldwide movement and not, you know, a United States thing there's the interplay between uh, countries and what's being developed in different places under different systems. How does that affect your view of how all this might play out? So, um, Kellen, uh, there are two things going on. Even the capitalism we were talking about is pseudo-capitalism because it applies to compute, not data. Okay. If it was applied to uh, data, Wikipedia, Wikipedia would not be asking for contributions. Okay. Uh, so it is actually skewed capitalism where it is for compute, uh, all the companies are wanting it, but they don't want to pay for the uh, data side, especially the open data. Uh, having said that, um, how other countries, I know a little bit about India and uh, a little bit about um, other places, uh, what they are trying to do is, uh, apart from the data, there is also the privacy, public and uh, private information, right? That uh, thing is going on. So. The way it is playing out is a, a, a good dose of uh, regulation. Uh, what you want this evolutionary society to be like, okay, the companies to be like, and of course, in an extreme planned society like China, you can control how the companies you want and what you don't want, right? And then, of course, completely unfettered or pseudo fettered um, uh, US, right? So I, I, I think it is a little bit about what the people are demanding. So you want a low entry barrier, you want um, companies, uh, should, should TikTok is actually playing out and that is actually exemplifying everything. Uh, there are people uh, who want it to be banned from a data privacy reason, but they want the entertainment. Okay, and the others want the entertainment and people are also monetizing it. So I, I think uh, it's, uh, it, it, it is an, it's an interesting dynamics going on around the world. No one has a clear answer, but um, uh, I, I think it would be a uh, it, it would be a mix of regulation, government intervention, how the uh, people want, right, and how much they say they can have. Other views? Uh, uh, kind of building on that, I think we have like part of the problem is we're like pretty good with national level legislation, but other than the EU going beyond one country, one set of laws um, is really challenging. And while entities like the UN were largely created sort of try to prevent war, um, they haven't really stepped in to try to set global standards for things like data. I mean, they have been doing work in sustainability uh, which is new and interesting and largely rejected in the US. Uh, but it would be interesting to say, how do we come up with data and um, computing policies where you have things that are fundamentally placeless? It kind of doesn't matter where it's happening or where the, the place is, is very uh, decoupled. Um, how do you come up with a set of standards that actually supports developers in taking risks and building things that they're sure will be able to reach out and work globally without um, the risk of sort of having a whole bunch of separate systems that have to work differently in different places and developing a more global standard of what is it to do this appropriately, fairly, um, a kind of a global set of rights for how people are being treated. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that goes beyond what any country can do and we don't yet have the mechanisms, uh, but maybe sustainability is really pushing us to work differently and, and we should learn from what's working and what's failing there. Nicholas, it looked like you were about to jump in to say something. Did you wanna 
make I was just I was going to throw sort of as, as opposed to the sort of the global regulation thing. I, I mean, I will a, a admit as a, uh, a, a totally American person, like I, all of my comments are very coming from this this uh this space um but i think there it's a good question of like you know we're concerned about these things um in other countries that have other views of data data ownership um and the ways ai are applied you know especially i think uh, one of the comments in the chat was china like if you've been to china and you look at wechat you look at you know some of some of the things that alibaba is doing in terms of integrating these data across platforms they're sort of i don't want to use the word ahead but they have a very different viewpoint on the ways that that data is allowed to be shared, the way the data is allowed to be used, and Europe has a very different viewpoint from us. So, you know, I think that's one of the interesting things is seeing how these uh, data ecosystems and how you layer these AI, how you put these AI application layers on top of that is different in these different places because many of these countries do have very different views of, you know, how sovereign that data is, whether or not you should use it, whether or not it should be shared, um, whether or not it should be shared with the government. Um, you know, and stuff like that. So I, I, I don't, I, I agree with John. There's not, I don't think there's not one coherent set of policies. Um, but again, John, you keep putting me in this neoliberal defense thing here. So, but I think that's kind of the interesting bit, right? Is you get to see how um, these things play out in different places. And, and, and again, it, you know, it's better or worse according to some set of value trade-offs um, in, in, in some of those different places. And I think that's a very interesting thing, um, but I don't have much more to say um, about what we, what we do about it because <laughs> it's above my pay grade. <laughs> Great. Okay. So, uh, and there's so so many issues to discuss, and um, some of the questions that were posted uh, ahead of time and in, in the chat as well um, at certain points were more technical. Um, and so, to bring in a couple of uh, technical angles in um, as we're drawing to, towards the end of our time, there were questions about capabilities. Um, contrasting open source models, um, which of course, you know, raises all these compute questions, you know, what we have access to outside of the big companies, for example, and being able to, um, uh, to get visibility into models, to be able to fine tune those models and shape their behavior and what are the limits to capabilities. Where do you see the contrast between what will be accomplished by big companies um, versus work in open source, either in universities or in industry. You know, is there always going to be a big distinction? Um, does that mean that there's no point in um, in different sectors joining uh, the game? Where do you see that going? I want to. I'm going to jump in and do my plug real quick, and then I'll let everybody else go. But I think I, you know, I've kind of been on both sides of the fence here, and I think it's. You know, it's it's it when I when I moved to university, it's because you can do very different things in a university than you can do in an in industrial lab, right? In, industry and government are are sort of industry, government, and university are all very different places with very different objectives um, in access to resources, uh, motivations, and things like that. So, you know, one of the things that I you know did at the university was like I I work with philosophers on you know how to like write this book right but at industry you're much more focused on that profit motive and in government you're much more focused on creating infrastructure uh, or, or or helping society right so I think it's important to have you know these three different places um, where these things can go and but I think the the question that you're getting at is what is the balance between them um, but they're always gonna I think they they are necessary at least in my experience. To, to because they are good and motivated for certain, they're good at and motivated to do certain things that are different from one another. Um, and they, it's kind of the, the axis of power thing. Uh, <laughs> you know, you, you need That's people poking at the, poking, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, you need people poking at the industry to be like, oh, what about this? And you, you need, you know, creative, small, innovative things and these cross disciplinary things that happen in university. And you need the scale um, that really comes from, you know, in the application across uh, across areas that, that you can get from government. So I think they they exist in in, in, a, in a, in a way to sort of balance out the, these objectives, right? What should we do or what can we do actually to increase, let's say, the capabilities that we could have outside of the big companies by joining forces? Are there ways that we can place ourselves in a more competitive position um, through you know, joining technical uh, resources, through joining our intellectual resources, um, sharing resources, uh, you know, are, are we just doomed to be less capable? No, no. Uh, act, actually, um, uh, I, I mentioned about uh, four pillars like research, education, productization, and regulation. At universities, we excel in education, in research, and in 
but doing uh, interacting across different groups, right? Humanities and so on. And Nick was mentioning about the bridging, uh, being the bridge, right? The second one is teaching. We can inform how to use these technologies much more for various applications. So that's the second one. The third one, you know, informing the regulation, what is needed, what is not needed. I think at being at the forefront, we can actually help it. And the disruptive ideas. So industry is great in productization. I was also there. So I mean, so industry is great in productization. Open AI productization was great, but the ideas behind the generative models had been around. So the point is that, uh, you know, the, the disruptive ideas will come from universities. We need to be more um, uh, synergistic. We need to be more collaborative. Academia has not been very collaborative across, I mean, in general, I'm just saying, uh, in, in different area. So, but I think our strength would come from uh, uh, our, these abilities to serve as bridge, to uh, with our teaching mission and also disrupting the apple cart. Okay, so as we're just uh, coming to the end here, I just want to make a few last comments. Um, we'll be kicking off the hackathons with our first theme uh, focused um, panel next week. Uh, and, that, and, and the way that these hackathons will work, um, they will have a series of these three theme-based panels, the first of which is education and the future of work, and then the next week, medicine and public health, and the following week, uh, uh, finance and economics. And then uh, at the with uh, kicking off with these panels, there will be an invitation to people who want to join actively into the hackathons. You can come into the hackathon space by submitting an idea for something that addresses these big concerns that we've raised today. We have the opportunity to join together, to um, uh, use the skills that we have and ideas that we have, resources that we have, but also through the tutorials to get more education and more skilled in order to join in. Um, we'll form teams to have team proposals. There will be a selection process and then finally a hackathon weekend closer to the end of the summer where work will be done. And out of five or six teams for each theme, one will be selected to receive a cash prize from the block center to build out their um, prototype into a real end user uh, application. And we'll celebrate those um, at the very end of the summer with an award ceremony. So I just wanna highlight that starting next week, we'll be kicking off these hackathon uh, processes. Um, so next week, our education and the future of work panel will feature four researchers. First, Sherry Wu from our own uh, Human Computer Interaction Institute, who works in human-centered AI. Lewis Johnson, um, who uh, specializes in AI in training and workforce development. He's at Alelo Inc. Um, Sharice Clark, who does research in education and equity at the University of California at San Diego. And she'll be raising some big questions, societal level questions about, um, about the implications, positive and negative, of the introduction of these technologies into an education space. And finally, Philippe Hoquet, um, uh, who focuses on educational assessment and obviously the big issues of cheating and new uh, ways of doing assessment are raised by these recent advances. And he comes to us from the educational testing service. So it will be an exciting panel of experts um, and there were a lot of questions actually also submitted um, for this AMA panel that were focused on education and I've saved them uh, for next week. Um, I'd like to encourage you to embrace the new landscape of learning and to remind you as even Roni pointed out that there um, are some dangers of, of job um, landscape shifting and different jobs opening up. And some of that requires um, more technical expertise, and, and some of it just means that um, moving towards IT in general is a productive thing uh, to possibly do. And so I'd just like to give a little plug again for um, our um, new uh, Certificate in Computational Data Science Foundations, which is launching in fall. Um, and if you'd like to sign up for more information, I believe Nicole is going to put this bit.ly CMU CDS URL in the chat. You can go ahead and click um, and um, you know uh, give information, uh, give your contact information so that you can get more information about that. 
Um, I'm, I look forward to seeing you all next week. Um, another thing to, uh, to do would be go ahead and post your reflections on today's discussion to the, the bit.ly Gen AI Reflect uh, URL, because we'll be collecting those comments as we prepare for our subsequent um, discussions. And um, also we'll be posting themes that come up in that in our Slack. And if you'd like to join the Slack, you'll have the opportunity to um, make a note of that in um, this reflection form. And then we'll go ahead and send you an invite. You'd be very welcome to join those discussions. I'm really, really pleased to see all the active chatter going on in the chat. Um, what makes it worth it to me to put in a lot of extra time to run these events is bringing voices together. I have a passion for bringing different perspectives together in communities, and I'm really excited to be part of this as a place where that can happen. And so I really want to encourage active participation. Thank you all for joining us, and we'll close for now, but I hope to see you all next week.